Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to make sure we have enough time for our presentation. Um, also, I know the schedule is a little confusing, but when we're finished here in this session, you will go back to the room that we just left. Okay. And then lunch follows that. So this presentation is Health IT and its role in population health. And we have two speakers. Uh, we have Mr. Mike Wade. And Mr. Wade is the manager of clinical application for Deaconess Health System. He's responsible for the development and deployment of the enterprise electronic medical records. And then we have Dr. Fred Wallish. And Dr. Wallish is a family practice trained physician. And for the past two years, he has served as the medical director for a multi-specialty group, and he's the director of Medicare ACO. He's responsible for the direction of population health services for Deaconess Health System and for the network build to clinical operations. So um, I, I will hand it over to them now. Thank you. I always wondered what my job is, and so you, you hear that and, and uh, think, oh, I better get busy. Um, first of all, thank you very much for, for allowing us to attend and to present. Um, uh, that, that first talk I thought was great, and I wanted to jump up and say, yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to do. You know, because a lot of those things, that her, her five C's, you know, wow, that's a, I actually wrote those down because that's a, that's a great um, segue into population health. And then those are the things that we're trying to do. So um, I, I'm going to give you a little more background on myself. I, I've served in lots of different roles in, in medicine, um, did my residency here at Deaconess. I left, had my own practice, I've taught, I've, I've uh, been an employed practitioner, I've worked in the hospital, I've worked urgent care, outpatient, um, I've been medical director at Deaconess Clinic, and now my current role is the uh, um, director of, of population health and, and accountable care for Deaconess. Um, so <laughs> can't keep a job for more than a couple of years, that's, that's the big problem. Uh, but there are so many things in medicine that that are changing and that are, are moving forward and um, we have to really keep up with those and, and really help shape those if we want to make it more usable for the patients that we care for. And and so the this marriage of, of technology and medicine um, is is really an interesting uh, thing. And you know, feel free to stop me. Uh, Mike said you can't stop him, but but uh, feel free to stop me as we go along and uh, ask questions because you know, that's the way that you learn the best. So what are we going to do? Uh, I'm going to run through the current state of healthcare, kind of just some, some highlights and why we need to change. Um, and then I'm going to dive into, you know, we, we toss around this term population health. And, and, you know, we could spend an entire conference on talking about what population health is. Uh, but, but I'm going to try and wrap that up or sum that up in, in a couple of slides. We'll see how I do on that. Um, then Mike's going to talk about the, you know, more the IT nuts and bolts, the stuff that I don't understand, and, and really how stratification and predictive modeling uh, kind of aid in what we're doing. And then we'll put some pieces together and, and talk talk to you a little bit about what we're doing specifically at Deaconess for a couple of, uh, of these programs and processes. And then we'll just summarize uh, real quickly at the end. So current state of healthcare. Um, I just pulled out a few statistics here. Uh, there was a recent CNN report that in 2013, 17.4% of US spending was for uh, medical care. Um, that, that's pretty staggering when you when you think about the, some of the amounts there. Yeah, you can also think of it uh, in another way. Six over sixty percent of the healthcare spending comes somewhere from the government, be it Medicare, Medicaid, other programs. Um, uh, you know, that, that's a huge amount of taxpayer money funding that that goes into healthcare. So we we need to figure out how to make that, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily spend less, but spend more effectively. You know, the money's there, we just have to do it effectively. Um, you know, by 2024, it's estimated that 20% of the of the GDP will be spent on health care. Uh, again, that, that rate is just not sustainable. 
um, additional 19 million Medicare beneficiaries by 2024. So, you know, those are people, we're living longer. I, I was at a talk yesterday. Um, actually, I should have started off with one of the slides from that yesterday. He, because this guy had done a study of why people fall asleep in lectures and he had he had risk ratios and and all of this stuff i, I need to i need to borrow that slide i didn't have time to to steal it to put it in today but um you know he, he was saying that that the uh um he even had some more recent data here and we're living longer so more patients are going to be living with chronic diseases chronic illnesses we're better at taking care of those things so you know the the medicare population is uh, is a significant um uh, set of patients that we'll be we'll be dealing with the other thing that, that really struck me when I started getting into this was that the sickest 5% of your typical patient population drives close to 50% of the cost of care. So, you know, if you're a healthy 20-year-old running around, can do everything, um, I think I remember those days, uh, then, you know, you don't need a whole lot of health care. Uh, you don't, there's not a whole lot of spend. But that sickest 5%, you know, you look at any doctor's panel, 50% of the cost of care. So we basically can't sustain what the path that we're on. Um, and, and I think the consensus is, and, and one of the reasons you're here, is to learn about how can we redesign and refocus our efforts in, in health care. What tools can we use to, to redesign the delivery of that health care? Some of the things that are already changing in, in the healthcare landscape, um, CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, is moving a bulk of the beneficiaries, both Medicare and Medicaid, to quality programs or, or reimbursement based on quality metrics. What does that mean? Well, right now, you come in and, and see the doctor, they submit a bill, they get paid. You know, it's, it's fee for service. Um, in, in the uh, in the value world, we go from you know just an episode of care getting paid for that to maybe being accountable for you know the total cost of care and, and some other uh, uh, being accountable for hitting certain quality metrics and, and making sure folks uh, are, are receiving the appropriate care. By the end of 2018, over 50 percent of Medicare beneficiaries, are supposed to be moved into one of these programs. <laughs> there are bundled payments, meaning you know CMS uh, for for hips, hip replacement, knee replacement. CMS says, okay, here's a chunk of money uh, to the health system. You pay for everything. If there's money left over, you've made a profit. If you spend more, it comes out of your pocket. So we're we're moving in that direction, um, and and these tools have to allow us to do that. Other insurers follow CMS, Anthem is moving all of their patients uh, or all of the, the folks that have an Anthem product into some type of value-based contracting. Um, the the uh, ACA, the uh, Affordable Care Act, has really um, increased the number of insured patients, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's better access or um, that, that that's lowering the cost of care. Um, they tend to be sicker and more costly in many instances. So, you know, that, that's a changing piece of what we're doing. And we talked about the fee-for-service model changing. At some point, it's, it's going to be capitated, meaning that you have a set of patients, here's a chunk of money, be it from the government, from uh, a payer, and you're responsible for, for taking care of those patients. That's what it's, it's going to be like in a couple of years, um, and, and we better be ready for that. Um, you know, the, the financial risk, as we talked about, is shifting the, to the provider. Um, providers are becoming more responsible for that total cost of care and, and trying to figure out, you know, how do we apply evidence-based medicine to, to you know, a, a, who needs a colonoscopy? Well, it's somebody over the age of 50, somebody with a family history of that, not just everybody. Mammograms, how do we effectively use those? How do we effectively use our health care dollars and, and uh, take on that responsibility of, of the cost of that care as, as well as the quality? Um, so let's just dive in and, and talk about population health for a second. Um, the, uh, the, the goal of population health uh, is, is something called the triple aim. Okay, I don't know if anybody's heard of that before, but um, 
probably about oh, 15, 20 years ago that term was coined. And, and what that means is the, the triple aim is, is a higher quality care of patients, a better patient experience. You know, Kim was talking about that uh, earlier today. How can we give a better experience to our patients that we serve? And then ultimately lowering the cost of care. Um, so that's the goal of population health. So what is it? Well, let's, let's define it by uh, a couple of different ways. And, and, and really, it depends on your perspective. You know, a, a hospital administrator, it's about redesigning care delivery to achieve better outcomes and lower costs. You know, kind of academic. Um, a medical director, care is delivered across a continuous setting through a physician-led team. What does that mean? Uh, data, analytics, and experience-based medicine that drive an import, improved patient experience. That's from the ACO, from an ACO director. And these are actually quotes from, from these individuals. Um, my favorite is the patient. I feel more in control of my health. Now I feel more confident in working with my doctor. You know, again, exactly what, what Kim was talking about this morning. Here's an academic definition from uh, two gurus of, of population health. Um, I'm not going to read that because I don't understand it. Um, uh, I, I think you guys are going to be provided these slides, so knock yourselves out when you get it. Um, here's my definition. And I wish I could claim credit for this, uh, uh, but I, I, I stole it. Um, population health is bringing the right care to the right patient at the right time in the right setting. Okay. There's a whole lot in that. I mean, if you think, oh, yeah, boy, that, that makes sense. There, there's a whole lot that goes into that and, and figuring out who that right patient is, what's the right care, you know, when do we provide that to them, and, and where, do we, where do we give it to them? Is it in the hospital? Is it an outpatient setting? Is it, uh, um, you know, in their home? You know, how, and how do we figure that out? So um, simple definition, but, but if you start thinking about that, there's, there's a whole lot that goes into that. But that's my definition. Um, actually, two other places in this in this presentation, we'll talk about that again. So, um, one thing that I, I like to kind of define and this is this is a little more theoretical, but but how does this really work, or, or what do we mean by this? Well, it's it's marrying the right data. You know, what's the right data? Well. You have to get data from multiple sources, uh, and, and Mike will talk a little bit more about this, but, but it, it's claims data, what, what the physician, what the practitioner um, sends into the insurance company, claims data. We, we need that back. We didn't used to have access to that. We do now um, in, in some of the collaborative efforts that we have. So, so using that to our advantage, and, and that helps coordinate care across a, a lot of different settings. High-powered analytics. Um, you know, how can, we, how can we use technology to our advantage? I'll, I'll give you a, a personal example of that. Uh, last January, sitting at home minding my own business, and uh, Visa calls me and says, and asked, uh, after they identified who I was, uh, asked me if I had purchased $195 worth of bagels at Bionic Bagel in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I, said, I said, no. And they said, so you didn't do it twice that day? I said, absolutely not. I like bagels. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But, but uh, it, that wasn't me. They said, we're taking those charges off. We canceled your card. We're going to issue a new one. It's taken care of. Well, how do they know that? Well, they used predictive analytics. They didn't see airline tickets charged to me to go to New York. They didn't see gas in Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania. They didn't see uh, some things that would trigger them to think, oh yeah, they, you know, that could very easily be him. Uh, plus, I never bought $195 worth of bags. Uh, but, but, you know, an insurance company, or excuse me, a credit card company can use that. Insurance companies use that all the time. Banks use that all the time. Why can't we in healthcare start harnessing some of that and, and use some of that to our advantage? So really applying these high-powered analytics to what we're doing. Targeted interventions. There are some things that work, some things that don't work. Um, and, and, you know, they say the practice of medicine is 
you know, 50% of what you learn in medical school is wrong for you students here. Uh, you just have to figure out which half in your career. So, you know, we have to figure out what, what are the interventions that really work for these individuals and, and target the right people with that. We have to have the right engagement. Is that face-to-face? -face? Is that over the phone? Is that in their home? Um, how, do we, how do we get these people engaged? Uh, again, you know, tying right into what, what Kim was talking about this morning, engaging the patients, engaging the physicians, and then really having an aligned network. Um, you know, having doctors and facilities work from the same platform. You know, we don't all have to use the same IT platform or the same uh, electronic medical record, but we have to be aligned. We have to be moving in the right direction. We have to work together and, and really al allow that data to be transferred across those settings or across different EMRs and, and make it work. So, you know, again, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces to that, but, but that in a nutshell is kind of what population health is and, and kind of the so thoughts behind it. We'll, we'll talk about some specifics about how we apply that here in a little bit, but now I'll uh, turn it over to Mike. All right. So we're not going to get real deep into a black box. We're just going to kind of have a little run through it. And what Dr. Wallace talked about, there's lots and lots of information out about all of us. The more you use healthcare, the more that's out there. The claims data, uh, the notes, the tests, the results, the charges, the visits, all that thing's out there. And what we have done is we have a partner uh, that provides us with a uh, population health repository and analytics engine. And what happens to create actionable data, data that can be delivered to providers and caregivers to help them make decisions with the patient for the best care. And we have feeds of all this information into this repository. So all this historical medication, uh, medication refills, utilization, assessments that are given to the patient uh, feed into this repository of health information. As well as we have a direct connection with our EMR. So our EMR at Deaconess Health System is EPIC. And it's the, it's the largest, most widely used EMR that's out there. But we have a direct feed of HL7 messaging into the data analytic, analytics engine to help process all the information that's available for these patients to come up with actionable data. So we give them ADT event, which is admission, discharge, transfer. Anytime you go to the doctor, you go to the emergency room, you can transfer from a unit to a unit. All those things create events in an EMR, and all that goes to them, as well as lab tests that are run, what are the results, and what the diagnosis or chief complaints or problem list elements all go to this repository of information, as well as notes. Believe it or not, there's a, a lot of providers that still either dictate or they use voice recognition to create their notes. Uh, but we feed those notes to the analytics engine as well because they've got natural language processing that evaluates no those notes and pulls out elements that can be discrete and move to a discrete setting and be processed in a discrete way. So it'll pull out a diagnosis and a narrative. It'll pull out test or uh, chief complaints. All those things can be pulled out of notes. So all that stuff goes into the, identifies the name of the population health uh, analytics engine, and it creates and crunches the number and slices and dices and it picks out who are the patients, uh, maybe the 5% or what percent that we really need to be concerned with. It looks at the whole population, but from that analytics and analysis of predictive modeling, it says, okay, if there's 100 people in this room, then the people in this front row right here, this is the percent of patients who are the highest risk, these folks right here. Everybody else has health problems and things that we need to worry about, but these five are really our drivers, and they probably need some more attention than everybody else because of certain things about them or their history or what's going on. And what happens is once that information is there, what do you do with it? Well, you need to deliver it back to the people who provide the care, people who make decisions, people who collaborate with patients and make things happen. So how does that happen? So this is the little chunk of the model of how that happens. So we have care advisors, which Dr. Wallace can talk about in more detail here in a minute. And care advisors are able to access and log into our identify analytics system and pull out information about these patients. It will say, these are the patients we have to be mostly concerned with. These are the people who maybe have the gaps in their care. These are patients who are at high risk of having problems in the future, patients who may need to have more attention and help and support. Uh, and to be concrete, it may be something like, in this room, this row, are the patients we need most concerned about. But of this row, really, the two on the end are the highest, highest risk, 
and the four on the far side are a little lower risk. So we can actually tailor the interventions and what happens based off of risk stratification, not just identification, but it goes a step further for stratification of that risk. And then for those folks who need it, a care advisor can be engaged. So not only log in, and they can be engaged with whoever maybe needs that little bit of help and collaboration and stewarding along their healthcare journey. And identify gaps in care. So it could be that, uh, what's your name, sir? Steve. So Steve maybe has gone to the emergency room three times with breathing problems and he's got some medications that are related to breathing, but nowhere in his record does it say he's got asthma. So it may say, the system may pull out, hey, this guy may have asthma. And it may prompt the physician to ask the question, does this guy have asthma? And the physician may go in and document and say, yes, he does, or maybe he does not. But it will prompt for that next step of information that all the elements of information say may be part of this picture, but we don't have the complete picture and ask the doctor if that's the case, or prompt the doctor for that information. Or it may say, he's never had a referral to a pulmonologist. Maybe he would benefit from one. So that information may go to the care advisor or the provider to maybe suggest or prompt those sort of things. And if it's indicated, then maybe you'll get that referral. So those sort of things that come out of the system then interface with the caregivers and the care advisors and the physicians to prompt better care and interactions. And this is just a small piece of the whole picture, but that sort of information in, processing information out, and then how does it affect where the rubber hits the road. And the next evolution of this situation, there, there are some folks in our department that have looked at this and said there's a couple of potential failure points in this model. This model works really, really well. This model allows it to happen in multiple EMRs. So it happens with Epic, but it also happens with other EMRs because the care advisors are able to log directly into the analytics system and get information out. But what we thought, we looked at this and said, you know, there's a little bit of a, a potential potential failure point, one being that the care advisor can't talk to everyone all the time. So, is it Phil? Steve. Steve, sorry, sorry, getting nervous. So if Steve has an episode tonight at two in the morning and goes to the emergency room, the care advisor won't know about that and they won't be there with him likely. So it may be helpful for everyone in the emergency department to know everything about Steve, but also to know that Steve is one of the people who are really, really high risk. How do we communicate that? Because the care advisor can't be everywhere. That's one picture failure point. The other picture failure point that we kind of looked at and saw was a lot of our providers have, have told us, uh, those of us who work in the EMR, that they live and die and work in the EMR. That's how they work. That's where they do their work. That's where they're at all day. So to get information to them, they don't check their emails more regularly. They don't want to log into another system. They want it to be within their workflow, within their processes. They want it to be within Epic at Deaconess. So how do we get some of the information in Epic? The care advisors do a great job, but for some things, it may be helpful if we can get it directly into the Epic system for them right in front of them so we don't rely on a potential failure point of the care advisor. So what had happened is some of the folks from our department, uh, some of you may know who they are, uh, Greg and Chris and uh, Dr. Edelman specifically had a lot to do with this. So we set up an outfeed from the LX engine into our EMR. And some of our staff created uh, sort of smart data, which is where you take some of these discrete elements that come out of the, the, out of the uh, analytics uh, engine database and you put it into a box. And once it's in this box, it's a smart data element box, you can put logic and things around it to make things happen. And that outfeed goes into that and these elements go into this smart box and then you can create rules based off this information. And that information, we created a couple of things and that's the things highlighted in red. So. One, we thought, if Steve goes to the emergency room, how do we let the ED know that he is Steve and he's one of those high-risk folks that has a lot of things going on and he's got a care advisor who helps him or collaborates with him on what's going on? Well, we took that and when you log into Epic and look at a patient's chart, there's a little place for a banner. So we put in there, out of this outfeed, if Steve's that person, a banner will show up and say, Steve is this person, and this is the person who's uh, care advising with him, and this is how you contact that person. So when somebody goes in the emergency room or another provider, that's real visible to everyone who uses that bank and they log in, and a person, Steve, or a person X who needs extra help or extra care or extra intervention or has a lot going on, it's really clear and communicated to everybody who this is and who they can contact and how it works. The other thing that they I have done, this is currently in process, is to automatically prompt providers for documentation. So instead of going through the care advisor to clarify and try to get the information, they're working on prompting the provider for 
the same thing, you know, uh, Steve, he's on these medications, he's got three visits to ED related to breathing. Does he have asthma? Ask that question directly to the provider instead of going through a care advisor for that to happen. So that's currently being worked on now. Uh, and then the thing that we're going to work on next is actually prompting provider for not only information and documentation, but for care elements. So. Steve's got this stuff going on, he's been in the emergency room, he's got some medications, so maybe he has his diagnosis. He may benefit from a referral to this specialist and prompt a position for that directly based off of the outfeed from the LX engine and the smart data elements and the rules that come out and interface with our EMR. So just to give you an example, so this is when you log into a patient's record in Epic, this is what it looks like. This is a, not a real patient. So the banner I was talking about is this section right here. So that pops up with anybody who falls into that group of high risk and been stratified and they've been assigned a care advisor. It tells you who it is, now you contact them. And it seems like a kind of a small thing and the scenario I'm talking about is pretty real. This does happen. And there's lots and lots of stories that come out of our emergency room and other areas where this banner popped up and they haven't been uh, assigned a caregiver yet or they haven't been to a PCP yet for whatever reason, but they've been identified as an at-risk at at person. And this banner comes up and the provider who sees them in the ED or some other clinic says, hey, gosh, uh, Steve, uh, he's high risk. I need to make a connection with this care advisor or who I can talk to about getting him a connection, someone who can help him out because I've talked to Steve and I've got his background and I know he's got challenges with transportation or he doesn't always get his medications filled or whatever. He needs someone to maybe be his advocate and help him out. And that connection can be made based off that banner signifying to that provider this person is available for help and they probably need some. And there's been lots of uh, times that that's happened. And then make that a little better. I, I kind of made it bigger but not too much bigger. You can see the banner a little higher. I think the other thing on the left is these are the things that are actually I talked about earlier of being developed and partially in production. Um, the best practice advisory, that's sort of the prompting for care things based off information out of our analytics. Or the RAF, RAF is asking about documentation elements that may be missing. You know, hey, this looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Is this a duck? Yes or no, and having it propped up. But these elements come prop up and are highlighted in the menu bar here on the side of the Epic screen. So that's the part that um, IT-wise that we're currently developing and in practice with. So that sort of information in, creating information through our analytics and feeds of multiple sources of information, processing that and then delivering that back into the process of care through the care advisor and then more and more to the providers themselves then can collaborate with the patient and advocate for the patient and create optimal care in the right place at the right time. Last time Steve sits in the front row, I'll tell you that. <laughs> You'll be getting a call from a care advisor later on. Um, so, you know, one, one thing that I, I just wanted to point out with this too, this, we work with a company called Evelyn Health. Evelyn is a national company that we've partnered with uh, to really take us from what we were doing to this, to this new space. And the, the IT team, and, and Dr. Edelman in particular, who was supposed to be giving this talk, and so I, I had to fill in, sorry. Um, but they did so much work on this, and, and Evelyn is coming to them, and, and even Epic is coming to them. You know, how did you guys figure some of this stuff out? So, so you know, again, as Mike said, that seems like a little, a little thing, but, but it's a huge step forward in identifying who these patients are. Uh, and, and just a couple of quick stories Mike alluded to um, if, if somebody hasn't engaged with a care advisor but they're eligible for that there's a number on here that uh, uh, let's say in this case Tara is not the uh, care advisor it says you know there's no care advisor assigned there's a number there that the, the hospital folks, the, the emergency room folks can call and get a hold of somebody and say, okay, maybe this person hasn't come up in your, in your rosters yet, um, but this person really could use some, 
some of these services. And, and you know, there, there was another story, a specialist was seeing a patient uh, for uh, and needing transfusions on a regular basis. The primary care doctor and the specialist weren't necessarily communicating all that well, uh, even though they were using the same electronic system. Um, they worked through the care advisor that was identified in this banner, and the patient's not going into the emergency room or the hospital to get transfusions anymore. It's all coordinated on an outpatient basis patients much more satisfied it doesn't take nearly as long it's a uh, uh, it's a, a better quality care and it certainly costs a whole heck of a lot less so you know just little things like that really put it in pers perspective to to you know even little changes uh, can make a big difference so let's put some of this together uh, one thing that I didn't define before was what's a population we talk about population health what's what's a population well a population, you know, again, depends, depends on who's defining it, but um, in, in our cases, what a, how we define a population is a, a group of patients sharing a common characteristic. Um, and bottom line is, you know, we talked about providers and, and health systems taking risk for the care of patients. That's what our population is. That's the people that, that we're most concerned about because we have to provide that care for them it doesn't mean that we ignore everybody else, but we have to provide that care and we're, we're being held accountable for that care on a quality point of view and a cost point of view. So in a lot of instances, a population um, shares the, the characteristic of, of who's paying for it. You know, and that may be, you know, not not the most altruistic thing that you, you're going to hear all day, but at the same time, that's the reality. So maybe Medicare beneficiaries or Medicaid beneficiaries, a common commercial payer. You know, Deaconess has uh, contracts with Anthem, with Humana, with United Healthcare that, that make us accountable for, for the care. Um, uh, we, we have risk with Medicare. Uh, we're one of 21 programs throughout the country that is in a new program with, with Medicare for our Medicare ACO. Um, so, you know, that makes us accountable for a lot of things. So that's how we define a population, okay? Somebody that, that we are accountable for by a contractual arrangement. So let's talk about this stratification. You know, Mike talked about this this row over here being the, the high risk need. Um, the next room's gonna be like church. Everybody's gonna move out of the front row. But but you, we have to look through that lens of, of stratification and say, who are those highest need patients? That doesn't mean that somebody sitting in the back over there doesn't, you know, couldn't benefit from some education or maybe having a pharmacist work with them a little bit or a diabetic educator, but, but we really need to identify those, those sickest patients because they need our help the most, they're costing us the most, and, and we need to improve their health. So we can, we can look at the highest needs, the moderate needs, the, the short-term needs, somebody just needs something to get through an acute illness, and then, then they're going to be fine again. Um, so, you know, Mike talked about uh, a little bit about that black box that, that all of this goes into, um, but it, it looks at, you know, what are the things that we, we measure on. It's the severity of the, of the, the chronic illness. Um, there's a lot of self-reported data that gets dumped into that too. Um, who's who's utilizing things the most? You know, of course, Steve's over here going to the emergency room, and you know, it may be uh, an inpatient cost, or or uh, you know, they've had ten different medications filled in the last two months. Uh, you know, whatever those those really high trigger or high high utilization things are. Um, and then the, the last thing that's important, but not always the, the biggest driver, is the cost. You know, somebody may be an expensive patient to take care of, but, you know, it's because of one particular medication or one particular service, and, and maybe they're not real high risk. So, so it's not just the cost, it's, it's their, their overall health risk. Um, this identify tool really runs through, at last count, it was like 1,300 different rules engines that, that it goes through to uh, come out with some of these, um, some of these targets. 
Um, you know, you think about the high needs person, somebody who has heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, near and dear to some people in the in the, the room. Um, frequent ER visits. You know, the moderate need. Maybe it's a, a smoker who just you know needs that extra push to to become an ex smoker. Um, you know, somebody who has a uh, history of coronary artery disease, but you know is doing pretty well. They've lost weight. They've exercised. You know, there there's still a moderate need there. Um, you know, and then the short-term need, somebody who really hasn't, you know, just diagnosed with hypertension and they need to get on their medications and lose some weight, exercise, you get them through that, and then their risk goes down. Yeah, so, so really kind of looking at your, your panel of patients in that way. Um, this is just another another way of doing that, uh, or another way of looking at that, but but it, you can kind of think of it as in, in a pyramid form, that, that top part of the, uh, um, of the pyramid here is really that top one to five percent that that's driving a lot of what we're doing. Um, the the one thing that I'll tell you that that's probably most important, and that's this little statement here on on this box, that this stuff doesn't replace the clinical judgment of the physician or the nurse practitioner or the person who's taking care of the patient. You know, there's there's still an art of medicine. There's still you know stuff that's up here that you know about that patient that can never be captured in in a computer. You know, uh, well, Mrs. Smith just lost her husband, and and he was really providing a lot of care for her. So her risk just went sky high. You know, a computer doesn't know that. Um, the physician, the nurse practitioner, the nurse, the care advisor, you know, those people know that. So so all of this is really looked at on, with another lens of, of that provider. Um, I won't spend much time on that because that, that, that's just another, you know, fancy way of, of looking at the things that, that go into identify, you know, the, the uh, these rules engines, the predictive models, all it really does is spit out this data that then has to be looked at by the by the person providing that care. Um, you know, here on the bottom of this is population health is about bringing the right care to the right patient at the right time. We, we call this our quilt slide, and uh, it's it's real busy and complicated, but but you can what we start doing is is bucketing these these different patients into complex care. Those are those highest risk, really sick patients that need a lot of touch, a lot of care. Uh, condition care, maybe one step below that. Uh, proactive care, that's that's things like, you know, here's a list of your 50-year-olds who haven't had a claim for a colonoscopy. They need a colonoscopy. Here's your your women who need mammograms, you know, and providing those things out to the to the providers data that they've never really seen before and it allows them to reach out to those patients, get them in, get them the needed services and, and avoid um, worse conditions or worsening symptoms down the road. So let's talk about how this, what this actually looks like in, in real life. Um, here's another busy slide, uh, but, but it, it, it kind of walks through the process of what this complex care visit looks like. So in, in the top box over here, um, you have the, the, and it's probably pretty tiny too, um, the care advisor or somebody within administration goes out to the physician and brings them a roster. You know, what's a roster? Well, again, we put all of this data into this data warehouse. It runs through all these rules engines, um, and, and it spits out a list of doc or, uh, of of patients that are attributed to a particular physician, and we take that out and say, okay, Dr. Steve, here's your list of patients. Help us validate this. And this is that, that piece where the, the clinical validation is, is going along with that, too. Um, I wish I could read that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, you know, we, we take that out. The, the care advisor, the, the doctor validates that. Um, care advisor gets a hold of that list and then reaches out and contacts those patients, explains the system to them, uh, gets them scheduled in, get, goes through a lot of, you know, once the patient says, yes, I'd, I'd love to do that gets them engaged in uh, some evaluations, does some things before that patient even comes back into the physician's office. 
uh, and, and then once that patient is participating, the uh, um, they do a lot of uh, assessments and a lot of things that then feed into that identify system. Really helps them out. Those care advisors work out of that system and and develop a care plan. Then the, the patient comes in to, the, to uh, what we call a complex care visit or a PATH visit, and PATH stands for Personal Approach to Health, um, brings that patient in for that. There's been a med, med rec from a, a pharmacist. There's been you know, best practices applied to some of these, uh, um, to this care plan. And then the, the patient meets with the doctor, care advisor goes in the room with the patient, with the family, um, and, and they talk about this care plan. And the patient has, has been has had input in that. Oh, those are things that I, I you know are important. I can't work on those now until I get this fixed. Okay, we're going to tailor your care plan to what your goals are and and what you and the doctor work out. Um, care advisor then spends some extra time with them, follows up with them. You know, in in a week or ten days, gets on the phone. Hi, Mrs. Smith. You know, this is Susie. Uh, remember, I was at your, your appointment, you know, we've been working together. How are you doing with these care plan things? Uh, oh, you can't get that medication, you can't afford it, let's figure out a way to do that. Rather than three months later realizing that Mrs. Smith never took her medication, let's figure out a way to get her that medication and, and bring those resources to the table. The whole point of this is to graduate that patient. Self-care, you know, Kim, Kim used that word this morning. Uh, uh, Self-care, that's, that's what we wanna, we wanna give these patients the education, the tools to manage their care on their own so they're not coming all the time with questions. You know, provide them the, the information. Teach a man to fish and he'll never go hungry. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we wanna do. Um, that patient falls off that roster. Next time that roster review happens, great, the patient's you know, not rising up there. Maybe they are, maybe we need to re-engage them, or maybe there was some catastrophic event and we need to re-engage them. So, so it's a constant process of re-evaluation. Doesn't just happen once, happens over and over again. Um, so in summary, we can't sustain the current path in healthcare. We need to change the way that we deliver care to individuals. Um, this isn't just me talking, this is, this is the system talking. Uh, we need to continue to leverage information technology, you know, and, and having teams that, that know what HL7 is. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, but, you know, teams that, that come together and take all this data and, and really understand the clinical aspect and understand the technology and bring that all together in an efficient manner. Um, we, we need to continue to develop and tweak our model, you know, right care, right patient, right time, right place. We need to continue to develop that and, and work for our patient's uh, uh, advantage. Um, and we need to engage the providers, engage the patients and families, and engage the leaders if we want to make this sustainable and, and make this change stick. So thank you very much. I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. So. We'll open that up. Are your care advisors, are they case management testing? Are they in your case management department? The, the care advisors are all RN training, um, level training, and so they are. We, we call it the PHSO, the Population Health Service Organization. It's really kind of a department within Deaconess that provides all of those care, or all of those processes and care. So it's, it's, they, there is some case management that's involved with that. They work well or play well together with the, with the social workers, with the pharmacists, with the other care team members. Which department is it in that same department that sees that they're, you know, <laughs> where the smart boxes and all that is coming to and there's a door that, hey, we have this tech station. Is that in that same department or is that in your CIT? Or it's, it's, it's in that same, that same, I mean, when I say department, that's not, you know, brick and mortar. It's, right. it's, it's, you know, kind of a continuum, but, but yes, that's where that lives. Because the care advisors work out of that system. Okay. Yes. I have a sort of a technical question. What kind of rules engine are you using? Something that you've developed, or is it something you? You've that's something that Evelyn brought to the table. Evelyn brought that to the table. Yeah, that's their turn. And the physician data, 
And then you have the clinical hospital data that goes into the system, physician data, what kind of needs do you get for those? The well, company's a physician medical billing company. Oh. And we do other technology things, but question. I'll just... Big question. Big question. Oh. Do you want to know what kind of feeds we get from physicians? So. Yeah, because you have the hospital data, mm -hmm. and you have physician data, you're trying to marry it and extrapolate it, right? Yeah, so the, the, the historical claim stuff goes in separately and directly into the, the, the database. Our stuff, since we have the enterprise-wide EMRs, so we have Epic in our ambulatory and in our hospital and also Epic for our billing. So all of that will feed in all of our claim stuff and all of our clinical stuff all feeds in together into that database. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So the you know physician inventory visits, the, their documentation, their problem list, their key complaints, all that feeds in. Are you using that now? Active? Absolutely. Active with Absolutely. The yes. Yes. Um, what kind of lab if any do you have with the claims and also with the pharmacy? Is that other pharmacy systems delve into your system? Or how does that work? So uh, it varies, right? So some pharmacy stuff can come in directly into the database, into the identified database, without coming through us. And some of that we use SureScripts as our pharmacy system to uh, get formulary data and uh, fill data and prescription data and e prescribe to Walgreens, whatever. So that information also is an epic for our patients that is happening now. So that stuff can feed in directly through us. So it, it can come in both two different directions. Does that make sense? Yeah, so with the claims, is there a lag at all with that? Not just pharmacy, but... Yeah, there will be a lag with the, the stuff that's coming in claims historical-wise, yeah, that there will be some kind of lag because you can think when somebody goes to the hospital yes. and then they're going to code the chart at discharge or relatively soon after discharge, and then that coded chart goes turns into a bill and that bill goes to the provider. So just by the nature of an inpatient stay and how that things are charged and coded and whatnot at, the, at discharge, there's a delay versus real time for that. But there is a, a nightly sort of exchange that happens all the time uh, with us and them. And, and this is getting more and more real time as, yeah. as we go along. Um, you know, the, the old system that we worked off of uh, uh, was a, a product of the advisory board, which is a, a national advising or a consulting company for healthcare. And the data that we got out of there was six months old, you know, and and a lot of times that did us absolutely no good. We 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 developed some rosters from this from from that data and took it out to doctors, and and they almost laughed at us because it was so old. One of the same doctors who did that when we took him this new roster, he said, "This is spot on. This is this is this is the best." And and he he can be a naysayer. You know, very informed, but a naysayer. And and he said, this is the best list of, of these patients that, uh, you know, I couldn't have come up with this list any better. So so it's it's getting better. You know, the little asterisk is, this is not a perfect system. There is no perfect system. There's nothing that's perfectly real time, but it's it's getting better. Yes, ma'am. And then we'll go back there. Do you have the ability to compare your hospital, your population, with those of other like-size hospitals as well? So you're looking at your patients with you know, the amount of patients with diabetes who are getting their hemoglobin disease and how spot on are we are there compared to you know another hospital of that size facility, maybe in another part or that yeah, do you use that as well? Absolutely. You know, there are all kinds of measures and all kinds of different uh, benchmarks that are out there. Um, you know, one of the nice things of, of our involvement with Evelyn is that they're a national company. So so they have partners of various sizes throughout the, the country that we can, you know, I can pick up the phone and, and call some of them and, you know, just kind of bypass the, the, you know, any of the benchmarking things and say, hey, how are you doing this? Or, or you know, I noticed that you guys are knocking this out of the park. Let's talk about what you're doing differently than us. So, uh, there, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that we're held accountable to and and, and measure against. So, are you saying your rate to mine? For certain things, yes. You know, uh, one program we did, we embedded nurse practitioners in some nursing homes. Readmission rates went through the floor. You know, it, it it's yeah. So, so there's you know lots of different things that go into this, but but absolutely, right, we'll get to you in just a second. There's I think by the, the chat ordinances 
will uh, you know, arrange and find out what gaps in services are. So what's been the trend of what are the four or five common gaps that you have identified that come up again and again? Um. I don't know that I can give you that list off the top of my head. I'll, I'll go back and research it, and I'll, I'll I'll get back with you. But but there are, you know, part of that too is looking at the kind of a systemic problem rather than with that particular individual and that particular. Oh, absolutely. You know, and we can break that data down by physician, by office, by county, by patient type. You know, we can slice and dice that all kinds of different ways to try and get at some of those answers. Um, uh, you know, but we also try to look at what what are the measurements, what are the quality elements, the metrics that we're being held accountable for, and match those up to those to those gaps, and and make sure that we're, you know, if it's you know a metric that doesn't really impact the care of the patient we're not held accountable to it just because we can measure it doesn't mean we should you know we, we want to measure those things that impact the care so um, you know uh, I, I, I'll, I'll get a top list and I'll, I'll get back with you on that one yes and I just want to understand it correctly you're using this analytic engine just for your accountable care organization at this time or across the board in order to use that tool, you have to have data going into that tool, okay? And and so that the the claims data, the pharmacy data, all of that, it, we only have access to that if we're if contractually we have access to that. So uh, uh, our our Medicare ACO, um, our our uh, contracts with uh, certain payers, you know, we get that data and can feed that in there. You know, we don't have access to that data from everybody, unfortunately. But as we do, you know, and, and to give you an example, we went from from kind of we call lives on the platform. You know, what what how many people are being utilized or touched by this? Uh, we went from about nine thousand patients to January first, over ninety thousand patients that we care for. You know, within our network that are are starting to be. Have some of these things uh, uh, applied to them. So, so it's it's not all, however many hundred thousand that we have, but but it's it's getting there. It's getting there. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate. Oh, did you have you were gonna? You, it was going. It was going. I was wondering, as far as your care advisors, do you ever run into issues? Uh, a lot of times in our hospital, we see we have a hospital-driven care person, but then maybe they're an oncology patient because they have one of those, and where the patient's getting four phone calls upon discharge from different groups. And, <laughs> Always bright ideas for managing that. Yeah, but it'll cost you. It'll <laughs> uh, I have a consulting business on the side. Um, no, that, that's a, an excellent point. You know, the 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 last thing that we want to do is confuse the patient. You know, and and patients get confused. Hi, this is Susie from United Healthcare. Well, typically Susie or you know Mrs. Smith is just going to hang up that phone. They don't want to hear from the insurance company, but. Hi, this is Susie calling from your doctor's office. You know, and, and that phone call is made from the doctor's office. So caller ID shows up. You know, Dr. Jones' office. Hey, that makes a big difference. Um, we have a transition care program that really works with those inpatients. So we have a, a care advisor who strictly does that transition work. So it works with the, the case management in the hospital, works with, with some of those folks um, to really help coordinate that care. What do they need going home? goes to the home and sees them the first time and then can you know we're, we're working out that coordination with the different specialties um, and, and the different uh, uh, the different people that need to be looped into that but it's, it's not perfect but but it's you know those are things that we're working on and and we're we're getting better at it all right well thank you very much for your time and I'll be up here for a few minutes if you have any other questions